Thanks, Lara. So nice to be with all of you today. Welcome. And welcome to this tour of the Upper East Side's neighborhood of Yorkville, historic German Yorkville. I'm so happy to have all of you with us today. We're going to look at some slides and I would love to have um, some, you know, some questions answered, some of your comments as we go through. This is something we love to do in person through the great neighborhood of Yorkville, but we're happy to do it from Zoom today and imagine we're all there. So many of you, um, this picture, first picture might look very familiar. Because the neighborhood of Yorkville we're talking about today was a, a neighborhood of immigrants. And immigration is so important to our history as Americans. We're all immigrants. Most of us come from someplace else. If it's not us, it's our parents, our grandparents, our great great grandparents. And if you are, if you member of your family came to the United States to New York City between 1892 in 1954, you probably um, came through this uh, important building. Does anyone want to answer that for me? A building you see in the background? Oh, all right. I will unmute Lorian. You're now unmuted. Go ahead. It's Ellis Island. Thank you. Ellis Island was an important building. If you came to New York City across the Atlantic Ocean and wanted to start a new life in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, um, and you came through steerage, which was, uh, you know, um, the least expensive way to come on a big ship uh, across the ocean to come to settle in America, you would have to get checked into Ellis Island and you would see the Statue of Liberty welcoming you. And I'd like you all to think about how you might feel when you saw that Statue of Liberty, say the years 1895, 1897, 1902, 1903, sometime way back then over 100 years ago. How might you feel when you saw that Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island? How might you feel if you lived on a farm, say in Hungary, what's now Hungary or Germany, and you lived in a small little village and you never saw tall buildings before, you may have never even seen electricity before. What, what might this look like to you? And if you came from one of those small towns, did you speak English? Probably not. Maybe you're so excited, but you also might be a little nervous. Just think about that. So here we go. We're coming through Ellis Island. And then this is a typical picture of uh, the Ellis Island experience, um, how immigrants came in. Um, and Ellis Island, I kind of like to think about it as like how you do attendance in school. You know, you get checked off a list, every your teachers know if you're here. And that's kind of what was happening at Ellis Island. They're kind of taking attendance. Who's coming in? There's a long wait, several hours to wind your way through the lines. My grandparents came through from Poland. Many of you must have stories of the same. And think about what you might carry with you. Back then, they didn't have as much stuff as we have now. Think about what's in those bags. What would you take, that little part of home you take with you? And you may never go back again that you wanna carry a little bit of your um, home country with you as you start your new life in America. Now, again, let's get back to Yorkville. So people are coming um, to Ellis Island and they're coming um, to settle in Yorkville from three main uh, nations, uh, countries in Europe. The main countries um, are Germany, Hungary, and what's now called the Czech Republic. But sometimes countries change their name. Back in the 19th century, which was the 1800s, um, the Czech Republic, even when I was a little girl, was known as Czechoslovakia. And before that, in the uh, 18, uh, late 1800s, it was known as Bohemia. So you might let me hear me call it Bohemia. So these people settled in Yorkville from those countries. And why did they come? This is a map of Manhattan, right? And they settled, look at my little arrow, they settled in Yorkville because other people that came before them from their same countries were already there. If you look down at the lower part of my map, that kind of grayish, maybe a little bit grayish green um, neighborhood called the Lower East Side, that's where many people settled first um, before uh, the late 1800s. If you came to um, America and New York City, maybe in the 1850s, you would settle on the Lower East Side. That's where um, the the boats came into lower Manhattan, that's people would settle were close to where they came in. That area got really crowded in the mid 1800s. So people started going to Yorkville because there was more room, there were more job opportunities. And so some other Germans and Czechs and Hungarians were already there. So when the people came from Ellis Island from those same countries, they wanted to settle with people like themselves. And I'd like you to think about that. Why would people wanna settle with people um, from their same countries? 
I'd like you to think about that. And um, can I get a hand? Anyone want to answer that question? Why would you want to settle in a neighborhood well, we, if with the, with we do have a, a yeah. Elizabeth? I'm going to unmute you right now. You're unmuted. Same language as the people around you. Thank you. Very good. Think about that. I like to, you know, always put yourself in the same shoes as other people. Um, and imagine if you had to move to a new country where you didn't speak the language. You probably want to find a neighborhood where, if, you know, they speak English if I was going somewhere foreign. And that's what happened in um, Yorkville as well. Look at this map. We all pretty much know what a map looks like. You're like a bird flying overhead of Yorkville here. And my green squares represent where the Germans settled in Yorkville. And 86th Street, if many of you might know 86th Street, uh, was known as German Broadway. It was, that was the center of German life. Those green squares represented German businesses like bakeries and restaurants, even churches, apartment buildings where Germans lived. The red circles represent the Hungarian neighborhood. Again, you wanna be with people that have your same kind of food. You could go to a Hungarian market. They might sell the spices you're used to for your Hungarian food. And then um, Hungarian Boulevard, the center of their life was 79th Street. Um, that was the main street. The main street for the Bohemians or the Czech people was 72nd Street. That's where you see those little uh, green hexagons, I believe they are, pentagons. Um, and uh, that's where um, many of the Czech or Bohemian um, restaurants, cafes, bookstores, uh, also, you know, maybe religious buildings were. So people settle with, like, with people like themselves so they could, you know, get to know a brand new world um, that be a little comforted by the fact that you're people like yourselves. Maybe even you have a cousin that came 20 years before you and they're living here and you would settle and start um, your new life. So we don't have a lot of immigrants from these countries moving to Yorkville now because for example, Germany right now is um, a very prosperous country, and we have actually many immigrants moving to Germany, not moving from Germany here. You'll always get people moving around, but not in the big numbers that they did in the late 19th and early 20th century to come to America. So right now, it, Yorkville doesn't look quite as German, Czech, and Hungarian as it did way back in you know, 1880, 1891, 1903, 1904, all that time period. Those people are, a lot of them are no longer alive and the neighborhoods changed a little bit. And that's what happens in life. Things change or evolve, if you know that word. But let's talk about it, this neighborhood still, because there's still some great stuff left. And that's what I think makes a neighborhood really special and important when you can see what makes it unique and special. And Yorkville is very special for being this immigrant neighborhood. And today we're going to look at some of the German um, aspects of it. So come along. All right, let's, um, excuse me, can we, I want to watch a little quick film clip about what Yorkville looks like today. It still has some small scale buildings, some restaurants, German church, shady streets, not so big and bold and with glass buildings and then uh, you know it still has a small neighborhood -y feel in many ways and here's a, um, the, the clock of Yorkville many of you might be familiar with. So Yorkville still exists and still has a very nice kind of small town character in many ways or I should say small neighborhood -y feel. Okay we're going to actually start our walk now like I would do um, in real life if we were in the streets of uh, Yorkville and we would start on 85th and First Avenue and walk a little bit over towards York and we would run into this uh, house. I guess we could, we all know it's a house, but um, does anyone notice anything maybe unusual about it? It looks a little different from what you think of a New York City house, you know, even a row house. What that you typically see? Does anyone want to tell me how this might look different to them from other buildings you're used to seeing in New York? Lauren, you're now unmuted. Um, it's shorter than most of the buildings that we see. It has shutters. Yeah. It has a front porch. It does have a front porch. What do you think it's made out of? Wood. Yeah. And do you see a lot of wooden houses in New York? No. You know, we don't build in it, um, wooden houses in Manhattan anymore. There was a rule way back in 1870, again, not 1970, but 1870 around then, where the leaders of our um, city, which was only Manhattan back then, so this rule is really only in Manhattan, 
but um, you didn't see, they said no more wooden buildings because back then, who wants to answer this? How did we keep our houses warm in the 17 and 1800s? And how did we light them up at night? What did we use? Wood release. Pardon me? Oh, oh yeah, does anyone want to say how did, in kind of the olden days, as we sometimes call them the olden days, how did we keep in a winter night, how did we keep all these um, rooms warm? We're gonna unmute Elizabeth now, Elizabeth. Um, by fire. Yeah, we had fire going. A lot of, almost every room would have a fireplace perhaps, and you'd have lanterns with candles and just open candles, and that wasn't very safe. And our buildings, look at this building, um, they're built very close to each other, so fire could spread very easily. And so what happened um, was we decided, hey, let's not have any more wooden houses being built. This is not great. You know, a, a stone and um, you can see a lot of brick. That's a little bit safer, right? So that's what happened. But they didn't say you had to tear down every building made out of wood. They said, uh, just not build any new ones. So there are about seven wooden buildings left on this whole Upper East Side of New York City. And that makes them very special because there's only a few left. And you also know they haven't been built um, since about 1870. So you know when you see one, it's gotta be very old. And this is one of them. Um, we like to talk here at Friends of the Upper East Side about architecture, about buildings and the stories they tell and what kind of buildings you need in your community. And I think one of, of course, the most important thing to have is a home. And this is an example of a German immigrant house. And so I, I think this is fun to um, walk by. And Mr. John Herbst lived here, and he was a German stonemason. He came from Germany. He uh, made things out of stone. We'll talk about those in a minute. And he lived here with his family. And what he, uh, but I just want you to say, there, I want you to know, there was not a rule that said you had to be German to live here. It's not like you had to be, but many people wanted to be a German, uh, to live here if you're German, because you, like we just talked about, you'd be with people like yourselves, you knew the language, so forth. But there, um, we have records that show that an Irish family lived on one floor of this house with him and his family. And he also rented out a floor to an English family. So we have records that other people lived here as well. But again, the neighborhood was mainly German. Let's talk about what went on. So this house, uh, here's an older picture of it. If you know, what can, can anyone notice what he um, was selling, what he carved out of stone? You can see it in, um, this is a sample of what he created for people or carved for people. Can anyone tell what those are in the front yard? Gravestones? Yeah, they are. They're tombstones or gravestones, yes. And um, no one is buried in this front yard. I sometimes get that and I understand that, um, that response. But he's just showing what he creates. And, you know, sometimes we do need those for family members. And he would carve um, these stones um, and they would be available to you if you would ever need one. And that's what he did with his, um, with his family there. That's what his uh, trade was, what his business was. So this is an example of a German home in Yorkville. So let's walk a little bit more. Let's walk down to 84th Street. And I want you to notice the buildings. The buildings you see in the front of the, um, of the picture, they're only about three, four stories tall. This is what Yorkville was like back then. And then you notice as you go a little back in the picture, you see a tall you know, skyscraper building. It's, um, and that wouldn't have been there, of course, in you know, 1880, 1890, 1900. The buildings were more three, four stories tall. I want you to think about another building that may be important to um, immigrants as um, they started their new life in Yorkville. You can kind of see it halfway down the block. It has a pointy top. Can anyone think of what kind of building might be important? We had a house. What other kind of building might be important to an immigrant or to anyone in their community? Can anyone want to guess? A church. You got it. So this is Zion St. Mark's Church. And um, it was... Again, a church, it started out as, um, there was a church also in um, the Lower East Side that combined with this church to make a larger church and um, it would serve the German community here. I want you to think about this building. Again, we say buildings have a story to tell. Think about this building. How I have two questions for you guys. How do you know it's a church and not a synagogue or a mosque or I don't know, a courthouse? How do you know it's a church and how do you know it's a German church and not a Hungarian church or something else. Does anyone want to think about that? Look at the building. What story does it tell you? How do you know that about it? Anyone? Hmm. All right. Just one second. Okay. 
The cross. Yeah, a cross is a sign of a Christ, of something Christian. And if you're Christian, you're Catholic, you are Lutheran, you're Baptist, you're Episcopalian, Methodist. So this is a Christian church. And how do you know it's a German church? That cross is a T, you know, that T-like structure on top of the church, yes. And how do you know it's German, you guys? Anyone? Just a second, Elizabeth. Sure. Elizabeth, you're, oh, sorry. I think you're muted again. Oh, wait. So Elizabeth, you're um, muted. Can you repeat, please? I, the words on the front of the ch church are in German. Thank you. Yes, you got it. So it basically says that Deutsche means German in German. So it's a German Protestant church of Yorkville, pretty much. Um, and yes, with the German language telling us it's German, there's also a date stone on the lower uh, left-hand side that's not, not easy to see, but it tells you, it you know, tells you about the date in German of the 1800s when it was built. And then we see that cross telling us it's um, a Christian uh, house of worship. And the other thing, let's look at some architectural details, you guys. So we have arches. Arches, I like to say, are like rainbow shapes. And you see several on this church, but some of them are also pointy. Those are called Gothic arches. They have a little point to them. So just try to find some arches, that rainbow half, or you can think of it as a half a circle or a half of a oval shape um, on the church. So we see some of those features. Um, I'll just give you a second. You kind of see over the front door, we have a pointy arch called a Gothic arch. And over to the um, right, on um, kind of what would maybe be, look like in a, another building, the second story, we see a regular arch. And then we see these, I think, are beautiful windows that look like circles with pretty patterns in them and colorful stained glass. And we call those rose windows. Maybe some of you have heard that word before, that term. A rose window, think of a beautiful blooming flower, a rose, and it's kind of round. If a rose blooms really big, it's in a round shape. And um, that's why these are called rose windows. They, they look like a beautiful blooming flower. So we see one right in the center of the church and one on the left, and you can see some different patterns in them. So again, we saw a German house, we see a German church, and again, buildings, these kind of buildings are important to many people and in many communities. It doesn't have to be a German neighborhood, but we're seeing how these German people came here and made this neighborhood their home. Let's keep walking. Does anyone know what this is a picture of? Anyone want to answer that? Lauren, you're on mute now. Elevated train on Third Avenue. Oh, good. This one's actually on second, but you got it. Very good. I'm very impressed. An elevated train, like elevator, we know that means a pie. We had these trains. They're really important to Yorkville. They're not there anymore, but they ran up and down Second Avenue and Third Avenue. And they, um, they were built like in 1878 for the Third Avenue one and 1880 for the Second Avenue one. And they were around till the middle of the 1900s. And they, the German um, immigrants worked on making these and they used them and they got around the city that way. But another thing that's important about them is they divided the Upper East Side. If we go back, can I go back here to the map? Yorkville's part of the Upper East Side, if you see that. And Yorkville is an immigrant neighborhood and not all the immigrants, they weren't very, a really wealthy crew of people, you know, we and the other crew of people on the other side of, the, um, of those elevated tracks were, um, Maybe there were a lot of very fancy, more wealthy homes on Central Park. And this train track was kind of not official. It wasn't an official thing, but that kind of divided the neighborhood. And um, the immigrants lived east of those um, elevated tracks. And um, so it, was, it kind of marked the neighborhood, just like you might have, I don't know, um, something, you know, a street that when you cross the street, you're in a different neighborhood, right? When you go through Central Park, you're on the west side. When you, you, you go in the other way, you're on the east side. So those train tracks were important to, um, it's, it's kind of how that neighborhood was uh, identified. So we had these train tracks is very important part of the neighborhood. And then um, let's walk up Second Avenue a little bit. Second Avenue was a commercial, really big um, commercial street in like 82nd Street was as well. We know what the word commercial means, anyone? You want to know what the word commercial means? We have a commercial area. Okay. 
I'm gonna think about that. Laura, any hands on that or should we kind of? I think we could go on on that one. Great, okay, commercial just kind of means you. Um, there was a lot of businesses there. Residential means people live there. Commercial means you work there. The side streets like 84th and 85th, those were um, more residential where people live, but the bigger avenues had more businesses. That's what we're talking about, thank you. Okay, so let's go up this commercial um, street. And what do we see? We see the Heidelberg uh, restaurant. And um, this was one of the German businesses we'll still see um, on Second Avenue. It's still there. It was opened in the 1930s, but it's still there. And does anyone know what the word Heidelberg means? I don't know. Well, it's uh, the name of a German city. It's a beautiful German city. And think, I want you guys to think about if German immigrants came here and they might miss the city they came from. Um, maybe you want to name a restaurant that you um, own after that to be reminded of home. Or maybe you're just really, you know, you came from Germany and you know you're a good cook and you know people might like your good German food. So you might name it that way to get, you know, people interested in, in your expertise of cooking food from where you come from. Look at this building. It doesn't look like a modern glass, shiny and metal and glass uh, restaurant. It looks kind of old fashioned and cozy. It has wood on stucco, that kind of white bumpy walls you see there. And it kind of looks like a, like a country, a place in the country or a cottage or something, right? And um, it, it's, you know, it's supposed to remind you of an old German setting. So um, let's see here. Inside it's cozy. They might wear traditional German clothing, play German music, and um, you eat German food. I'm gonna play, I hope you can hear this a little bit. Well, I'm gonna play some German music to get you in the spirit of things. Hope we can hear this a little bit. Think about having a good time in this restaurant. <laughs> So that you can hear some, you know, kind of good time music, have some good food and uh, see some traditional German clothing. The waiters and wait staff might wear, a the women might wear a traditional German dress called a dirndl dress. And the guys might wear lederhosen, which translates into leather pants. And you may have seen clothing like this before, just to remind you of um, traditional um, clothing from those areas. Um, and even nowadays, I have family in Germany, and um, the women, some of the women I know, still during important and holidays, they might put on their dirndl dress, and, and men might wear later hosen to, uh, to, you know, to celebrate their heritage. And some of you, I want you to relate this to family history that you might have. Think about the clothing you have. Um, maybe your family came from a different part of the world and you might not wear it every day, but you might have some traditional clothing to celebrate the lands that you come from, music from those countries, and think of the food too. German food's very hearty. Uh, a lot of meat, these big pit, um, pretzels you see here, sauerkraut, German tropical cake, apple strudel, a lot of sausages called Wurst. And in German, um, uh, they celebrate their food and you, you know, maybe you can't go to a restaurant every night. So right next door to the Heidelberg, uh, you're lucky to find Schaller and Weber. This is a name of a butcher shop. Butchers are people that prepare meat. And um, this is where you can go buy some German groceries. And again, all throughout the, uh, Yorkville, you would find Hungarian markets, Czech markets, probably a little bit different each of them because they have different spices, different ways of preparing food. And that would make people feel really at home, right? Say if you moved and you might miss New York City pizza, wouldn't it be nice to have uh, maybe a little American neighborhood if you're in a completely different part of the world and be able to get a slice of American New York style pizza? So that's what's kind of going on here. Schaller and Weber, that's the name of two men that opened up this butcher shop in the 1930s. And the Schaller family is still involved. You can see them here. He, uh, Mr. Schaller standing up front with all um, the other butchers that work there. A lot of, again, meat, sausage. They also sell things like German potato salad and coleslaw and um, all sorts of delicious things and some products right from Germany, you know, some um, you know, pickles and things and mustards that come from, um, right from Germany. So uh, it's, it, you can still go there and, um, you know, hopefully soon we can uh, go in and, like, and uh, greet our friends here at Schaller and Weber.
for it, traditional German shopping. That's right next to 86th Street, which again, what is it called? German Broadway. And this is an old fashioned picture. You can see the elevated train. The street was lined with um, German shops and cafes or restaurants, all sorts of, um, you know, wonderful places to remind people of where they came from. And I have to tell you right now on 86th Street itself, there really isn't a lot left of um, these places. Uh, on the side streets you have, again, Schaller and Weber and the Heidelberg. But a lot of these older places have been, um, you know, there's now apartment buildings there, maybe, you know, more modern day American movie theaters I can think about and bookstores, but um, not a lot of this left. Times change neighborhoods evolve. Again, the Germans that moved here in 1880 are not around anymore and um, neighborhoods change. But we're, I'm so happy that we do have some things from German Yorkville to still see. Here's another picture of some of the German, even in the 1970s, um, the picture might be from around then, 60s or 70s. You can see people uh, still in colored pictures. You can see um, you know, some German markets and restaurants. Cafes, Germans like their, uh, you know, German cakes and cookies and things like that. We're going to walk, we're pretending we're walking up 2nd Avenue some more and we can run into off the side to the side um, St. Joseph's Church, which was built um, for German um, worshipers, again, another Catholic church and another, I should say another church, this one's Catholic. And um, again, you see that big rose window up front and this church really celebrated um, in the German heritage of the area. And even back in 2008, we had a Pope who's a leader of the um, Catholic Church in Rome in Vatican City, if you're familiar with any, some Catholic Church um, history. Uh, the Pope was called Pope Benedict, and that Pope was German just um, a little while ago. And he came to this church to, because he was from Germany, and this is a German church. So there's some famous things that went on here, but it really celebrated um, uh, the German uh, population here, someplace for them to go to church more, you know, if you're Catholic. Okay. Here's another German and a little bit of French influence in this restaurant on 88th Street as we walk up um, 2nd Avenue. We can, we have a little bit of this German heritage still left for us to experience in Yorkville. What do you think this is? What's this look like to you guys? Can you guys um, tell me what this might look like? Anyone wanna, anyone uh, wanna tell me what kind of, what do you think, uh, what kind of building is this? There any hands? Okay. Um, well, on the bottom, what do you guys see? I see some stores, right? I see some, um, a deli it looks like, and that's what this was probably always like. Um, it have probably had some stores on the bottom floor, a grocery store of some sort. But this, um, and above it, what's it look like? Well, I think it looks like apartments, and it is. This is called a French flat. Now, um, and it has a name, it's called the Kaiser and the Rhine, and it was built in the 1880s. And um, this was a type of building you could live in um, called a French flat. But let's go across the street for a minute to see another kind of building. We'll talk about both. Across the street on 2nd Avenue, between 88th, 89th and 90th, are these row of buildings. And they are very, they're not this anymore, but they were built as very crowded apartment buildings. Does anyone know the name of those? What, what a very crowded apartment building might be called? It begins with a T. Anyone out there know about that? That we associate this time in immigration that people lived in uh, buildings, apartments, something with a T. Henneman? Thank you. Very great. Yeah, very good answer. Um, these are tenements. This is a row of tenements, and it was across the street from the French flat I just showed you. These are two different housing types. We did see Mr. Um, uh, the German uh, apartment, um, Mr. Herp's, uh, excuse me, um, house. So you had some houses, but most people lived in apartments. Again, immigrants that came during this time usually didn't have, a, you know, a, weren't very, very wealthy, and they might have to live in a crowded apartment. You know, you would live in, this, you wanted to get, you wanted to start a new life, and and um, you would live in a small apartment to make some money, and maybe your children could live in something a little bit bigger. But these apartments are um, crowded, and uh, you know they would wouldn't have a lot of light and air access with um, windows. 
But um, as time went on, we had um, laws that said tenements had to have a little bit a better um, chance of having windows for light and air to get in so it wouldn't be so hot uh, during the summer and you would have safety for fire. They had laws you would have a fire escape. But um, when tenements first started out, particularly on the Lower East Side, when the earliest immigrants came, they were so crowded and not very safe. And um, when you got to the um, late 1800s up here, when these were being built, they were a little bit better, but they were still crowded. Um, but I want you to look at these. What do you see at the top of the building? Um, uh, there's a fancy trim. And that word, I, mean, I, I don't know if anyone knows it. Anyone out there it's, uh, know what the fancy trim on the top of that building is called? It's, I don't, it's, it's kind of a fancy word. But it's called a cornice. C-O-R-N-I-C-E. It's like a fancy hat on a building. So these tenements actually were, they were nicely um, built and pretty from the outside, but very crowded inside. They had this nice uh, crown on them, as we see here, and, um, you know, some nice detail. They were made of brick and pretty sturdy. They had, um, always had stores on the first level, but inside very, very crowded. The people that owned them would try to get as many people you know, to make, uh, to pay rent inside. And so they'd be very crowded. And um, they still line the streets of Second and Third Avenue all over the city, really. But they um, have been changed. It's not legal to have, a, you know, these un some of the unsafe conditions that we associate with tenements. So a lot of them have been re um, refigured, but we still have the outsides of the building. And um, they're quite, I think they're quite lovely and nice to look at. And they make our city feel special. They're not too tall. They're just a nice part of the streetscape or the, you know, as you look down the street. So that is a tenement. Let's go back to, oh my, let's go back here to the French flat. I wanted to show you both of these. The French flat called the Kaiser and the Rhine was right across the street from those tenements, you guys. And it is, um, if you had a little bit more money, you might be able to live in a French flat because unlike um, tenements, they had a little more room. You might have a hallway in your apartment building. Some of the tenements um, just were called what we call railroad flats, like a railroad car. You walk from one room to the next room to the next room, get about three rooms. You'd have one bedroom usually, a kitchen. We walk from the bedroom to the kitchen to the front, like living room parlor. And you might have to share a bathroom out in the back courtyard. You might go downstairs to use that or you might um, just have one uh, bathroom or toilet even just for um, the whole uh, floor that you share with all the other families on your same floor. If you had a French flat, you would maybe, you would have a little more room. And this is what this one was. And again, some buildings have names. Can you, anyone, anyone else think of a building with a name? It doesn't have to be in New Yorkville. Do you think of any um, buildings all throughout New York City Ed, that might have a name? Any building you can think of? A famous building with a name? Um, Warren or Maven? Empire State Building, yeah. Building, Twin Towers. You got it. Thank you. You're right. And just like those buildings have names, this has a name again, the Kaiser and the Rhine. The Kaiser was a, a, a ruler of, of, of uh, Germany and the Rhine is a German river. So think about if you did that same thing moving to Germany and you wanted to name it after an American river and an American ruler, you could think of a name you might call it right? Like the Washington and the Hudson or something, right? That's kind of what's going on here. And um, again, this building has a lot of pretty details on it. The, I really think architecture is a great way to, um, way to learn. You can learn about art, you can learn about history, so many things with architecture. And um, the art you can see, uh, this building is a work of art, in my opinion. You see beautiful on the second floor, uh, beautiful patterns of brickwork. I see arches, those are rainbow shapes I talk about um, higher up. I just think it's a pretty building. So, um, you know, I, again, something to admire in our Yorkville tour here. Okay, so these again, examples of how German immigrants lived. Tenements, French flat. Let's walk up to the corner at 90th Street. We have, what's this look like to you guys? Anyone wanna think, is this, this is a little bit bigger than a normal apartment building. Um, what do you think this may have been? It's not there anymore. Anyone want to guess what this looks like? <clears throat> Any guesses out there? Hmm. Well, it was a big factory and it took up several blocks 
and it was called Rupert's Brewery. Now a brewery is a beer factory and you may have heard of beer as an adult drink um, it's, um, that Germans and Czechs and Hungarians all uh, uh, make. And they had many beer factories in Yorkville and they're right in this area. And this beer factory was owned by the Rupert family. And it, you can see, what do you see? Can someone please answer this for me? What do you see in the front of my picture here? In front of, what's running in front of this factory? Can anyone see, what is that? Elizabeth? A railroad? Yeah, that's at 2nd and 3rd Avenue L. You see that elevated, remember we talked about that? The elevated train. So it helped get people to and from the area, right? So that was a big part. Remember, it's not there anymore. These things were torn down in the um, 1940s and 50s, so they're not there anymore. And actually, this whole factory was torn down in the 1960s. It was around for almost 100 years. But again, times change, and they weren't make, having all the beer made in Yorkville anymore. It was going to even bigger factories in other parts of the country. So this was torn down. But it was, very, it was a very prosperous uh, company, meaning they made a lot of money. And it took up all these blocks here in Yorkville, and it was a big part of the community. And this man got very rich making beer, and his name was Colonel Jacob Rupert. And his father started the company. His father was um, from Germany, and his parents, um, and he was also German-born here. But look, he, they said he always wore very nice clothing. Look at his little nice bow tie there, and he made a lot of money making his with his beer factory, and um, let's talk about that. He had a fancy house on Fifth Avenue that he lived in and oh, I should say he lived around the late 1800s early 1900s and he was very famous for this does anyone who do you think is in this picture with him we'll talk about what he did with his money does anyone want to guess who's in this picture with him Lauren Babe Ruth Babe, who is Babe Ruth can you tell me baseball player yeah who did he play for Yankees do you know who he played for before that yeah. Red Sox? Yeah. So Colonel Jacob Rupert in 1919 brought Babe Ruth from Boston to New York. And that's what he's really famous for, too. Here he is shaking Babe Ruth's hand. He made a lot of money. He bought the New York Yankees. He brought Babe Ruth to New York. So that's something. A little bit of Yorkville history for you guys there. And there he is. Okay, they tore down that factory. Again, we don't have everything um, left of old German Yorkville. They tore it down and now we have these big towers um, where the factory used to uh, be. They're called Rupert Towers. So we have that little bit of the history left. We have his name there or his family's name. That's about it. But um, we do have the memory of that factory and all the things that uh, uh, memories of all Yorkville in many ways. We have German bakeries that are an important part of the community. Um, German food we can get at Schaller and Weber. You can get those good pretzels. They still have wonderful parades in, um, to celebrate German history in um, Yorkville. And we do that in other parts of the city too, wherever you guys might live. Um, you know, there's often parades to celebrate festivals and um, different ethnic heritages. And it's great to, um, I think, to remember the parts of our history like this and to celebrate it. And it makes our neighborhoods special, makes them different from other neighborhoods. And it's just a, a great way to remember that we're all different, but we all have something interesting to add to our immigrant history um, here in the United States. So that's a little walk through Yorkville. I'm so glad you came with us today. Um, it's so nice to have you. I would love to um, have anyone have any comments or questions. I'd love to talk to you about it more. Any, um, anyone have any food? If, if you'd like to share um, any food that you like from different countries, it you know, makes it interesting to have different things to eat, different kind of music from different places, different neighborhoods you've been to, if you've been to Yorkville. Does anyone want to share? Lauren wants to share. I'm going to unmute him, but also I think I'm going to suggest you um, going to unmute everyone so we can all turn our videos on okay. start the recording and re uh, at, have some questions and answer. How about that? That's great. So Lauren, you're unmuted. It's actually Lauren's father. Thank you so much. This was, this was great. Um, question about Rupert's mansion. Is it, I guess, gone? I don't recognize it. And where was it? It was gone. I forget the exact, I think it was in the 90s. My, is 95th ringing a bell to me, I believe. It's not no longer there. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So how about we, um, if everyone, I'm going to unmute everyone.
Um, there are a lot of questions on the uh, on the chat, so if we can all unmute ourselves um, and raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Should I stop the share right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Here we are. Hi, you guys. Hi, everyone.